um, be, uh, I had only some business contact with him because Miramax owned Nanny McPhee for a while and were very, very difficult and obstructive about, because his bullying behavior patterns also existed in his business world. And so my really main contact with him was shouting at him down the phone um, that I never wanted to work with him ever, ever, ever. And um, so when I came into rooms where he was, which often happened, it, you know, he would um, look, well, actually frightened. Um, because I think that's the sort of thing that happens. If you call a bully on their behaviour, they tend to um, avoid you. So, so you, call, you called him out for being a bully to women? Yeah, not, no, no, not to women. This was in his business practice. I didn't know about these things, but they don't surprise me at all, and they're endemic to the system anyway. And I, what I find sort of extraordinary is that, you know, this man is at the top of a very particular iceberg, you know, and he's, I don't think you can describe him as a sex addict, he's a predator, that's different. He's, uh, as it were, the top of, the ladder of, is uh, a system of um, harassment and uh, belittling and bullying and interference and what, what my mother would have referred to in the olden days as pestering. Is he pestering you? That's the word we used to use in the olden days, if you recall. This has been part of our world, women's world, since time immemorial. So what we need to start talking about is the crisis in masculinity, the crisis of extreme masculinity, which is this sort of behaviour, and the fact that it is not only okay, but it also is represented by the most powerful man in the world at the moment. So when you describe him as being the tip of the iceberg, mm. do you think there are others like that in your industry in Hollywood? Of course. Many? Many. To that degree? Maybe not to that degree. Do they have to all be as bad as him to, to, to make it count? You know, is it, does it only count if you really have done it to loads and loads and loads of women, or does it count if you do it to one woman once? I think the latter. It's been written up that you rebuked him on the Bride's Head set um, for trying to put your co-star on a diet. What happened then? Well, it wasn't Harvey, actually. It was the other producers, and I just... My, my co-star, yes, had been told... It wasn't him, then. ...by the producers that she had to lose weight, and I said that I would walk from the film if I heard anything like that again. I mean, I will always speak up because I'm bolshy and will take someone's head off if I see anything like that happen. But, you know, I'm lucky. I'm, 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 I've had education. I'm white, you know, which makes it easier for me to speak up, for instance, than any woman of colour. Um, I've, I've worked sort of independently until I was 30, so I was, I was always extremely feminist, extremely aware of, of the oppressions and the, well, just the little run of small cruelties, humiliations that women all experience. I mean, you, we, there are 66 million people in this country, and maybe 35 million of them are women. Now, you speak to any of those women over the age of 15, and they will all have a story to tell you about some kind of harassment, whether it's being felt up on the tube, happened to my daughter the other day, whether it's being nine years old at a children's party and some magician sticking his tongue down my throat, whether it's being in a lift with an older, powerful man who I was getting on with quite well when I was 24 and suddenly lunged at me. They, everybody's got stories like that. Everyone. When you knew Harvey Weinstein as a bully, is that something that you would have passed on to other people? Did you tell people that that was what you encountered, or did you feel that it wasn't your place? No, no, I didn't. I mean, we discussed it. I discussed it at length with my producer, Lindsay Duran. We discussed the fact that we were really glad to get our property away from him, and I often expressed the feeling that I had of... I mean, whenever I was in a room with him, he gave off the most appalling aura. So how would you explain, we know now that people knew about this for decades, his sexual behaviour. The Harvey Weinstein uh, sex scandal has exposed uh, the metastasy, the, the cancerous nature of rape culture in Hollywood, rape culture in business, rape culture in um, public life in America. You know, when, whenever you hear one of these right-wingers talk about rape culture, they're always very concerned about rape at the hands of, of, of brown people, rape at the hands of Muslim men, rape 
at the hands of Boko Haram, rape at the hands of, uh, you know, uh, supposed inner city gangbanger rapist, Mexican illegal immigrant rapist. But, you know, look, rape and rape culture is a problem that we all have to confront. Rape culture is not just explicit rape culture like in the Middle East where women are blamed for being sexually victimized, where women are punished physically for being raped, executed, you know, tortured for being raped. Uh, we have a problem here in the enlightened West with rape being condoned, rape being ignored. In the, in the Weinstein case, um, the, the, the rape culture was premised upon Harvey Weinstein can hurt you in the industry. But this, this kind of rape culture exists in all the big business in America. You know, Donald Trump was, has been accused of uh, sexually harassing um, and, and uh, sexually assaulting women in the workplace. Uh, he has more or less admitted to uh, engaging in sexual assault in the workplace. And, and sort of what throws me about this is this kind of our team versus yours where a lot of the people on the right or a lot of the people in the kind of this reactionary anti-SJW group have this reservation of, well, this problem is happening, but I can't admit it because then feminism wins or social justice wins or something like that. It's not a scoreboard. Rape as a problem um, is a part of every society and part of every structure of society. You know, uh, uh, rape is about power. Rape is about privilege. Rape is about degradation. It is a problem, uh, particularly in America, that is just so um, overlooked or, 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 you know, presented in reductive terms. I don't think it, that, that, that a lot of people in America want to admit that rape victims are not getting a fair shake, that, that, that women are subject to um, sexual victimization in the workplace, and men as well. Um, one, of the, one of the people who came out uh, during this uh, sex scandal uh, was uh, uh, Terry Crews. A, a, a actor, an act, a well-known uh, comedic actor, um, a physically large man, an ex-football player, about the same size as me, if not a little uh, bigger. Um, he's either 6'4 or 6'6. He's like an inch or two bigger than me, and he's a big, strong dude. And, and he was subject to uh, being sexually molested by a producer at a party. So, I mean, it can happen to anyone at any time. There's a rape problem in the military for men and women. There's a rape problem in the correctional uh, facilities that is probably skews towards men, but also includes women. Um, this is not necessarily, not necessarily an exclusively gendered issue. Are women more vulnerable to rape in this society? Yes. I think that we also need to acknowledge that women are uniquely experiencing sexual victimization in the workplace, that women are uniquely experiencing um, verbal harassment in the workplace, and it's a legacy thing. It's just like when we talk in social justice circles about why um, black Americans have difficulty getting justice in regards to police brutality, it's why black Americans have difficulty and face specific and exceptional um, obstacles in the workplace. It is it is legacy, it is heritage. There was gender apartheid in America for a long time. There, there were um, laws in place when the U.S. Constitution was uh, implemented that excluded women from participating in the higher echelons of society. They excluded, excluded women from having the vote. It excluded women from owning property, and I think that this sort of gender apartheid is as relevant as racial apartheid in terms of 
influencing the existing power dynamics um, that result in this kind of abuse. This idea that men have the right, that, 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 that powerful men have the right to ask for sexual concessions or sexual appeasement from um, women in the workplace is directly correlated to the fact that women have not always been equal people in this Western, enlightened civilization. Um, women, you know, were slightly, uh, particularly, you know, in the country's founding, you know, women were de facto property. You know what I mean? Like your wife was the same as your house or your wife was the same as your livestock. She was a, she was effectively a uh, another commodity. You know, your daughter was uh, you know a commodity as well. Um, as long as as long as women are perceived and consumed by a society as transactionary goods, um, and and that's also look. Sex trafficking is deeply deeply interconnected with this problem of. Women are objects. Women are toys. Women are sexual implements. They, you pick them up, you use them for what you need, and then you toss them aside, or you don't. The other problem is kind of like this 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 friend zone fear that men have of like, well, why am I going to help this woman if she doesn't give me anything in return? Well, you know, look. I think our society would be be better off altogether if men started to understand that you know look anything you would do for a male friend without asking for a blowjob you should probably do for a female friend because they are your friend this kind of a, this this friend zone phobia is part of this mra pua problem when it comes to women and objectification of like well what's she doing for me why is she making me her friend? Why is why is this? You know, they feel degraded by the idea that somehow they would be engaged in a friendship or provide some kind of mutual um, assistance for a woman and not get something in return beyond just friendship. Um, I've gone a little far afield, but you know, look, I just I needed a video to kind of vent out as someone who has female friends and family members that have been victims of sexual assault, victims of sexual harassment, um, to kind of think out loud about where the root of this, this really, really overlooked social epidemic is coming from. I think that we're all coming to a point of realization, especially with this Me Too hashtag. The Me Too hashtag has been very important. Um, it is kind of like when, when you know, when I was a kid in the 80s and 90s, when, when gay people started coming out more often, I think that the victims of sexual assault need to have a mask coming out, just like the LGBT movement had in the 80s and 90s, where people start to realize that rape victims are not these abstract um, objects, but rather that it's your sister, it's your mother, it's your cousin, it's your brother. It's somebody in your life. It's your favorite actress. It's your favorite director. They have, you know, the, 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 the people that compose our lives are suffering. 